Facing its most challenging test since independence 55 years ago, what does the future hold for Singapore? The pandemic has focused attention on the link between economic activity and climate change. How will this impact Singapore's goal of building a sustainable nation? Can Singapore recalibrate fiscal priorities in the face of increasing environmental concerns? Shifting geopolitics are changing the region's dynamics. Will Singapore be forced to take sides as China grows increasingly influential? As the economy continues to contract, what does this mean for the city-state's social unity? And what will be the biggest challenges to Singapore's economic recovery? Can Singapore emerge stronger and greener? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of uh, CNBC and Credit Suisse, welcome to the 11th and final uh, webinar uh, in a series which uh, super trends uh, that franchise has uh, become. Uh, our guest today is Senior Minister Tilshi Hien. Uh, good afternoon, Minister. Good afternoon, Great to Martin. have you uh, with us. Uh, for uh, folks uh, joining us now from uh, whichever time zone, uh, we've got about a little less than an hour to spend uh, with you. Uh, towards the tail end, we will take questions, if I'm not mistaken, I think questions are, are going to be coming in to my iPad here. Uh, I'll try and get through as many of them as I can. Uh, but first, let's start uh, with our conversation with uh, the minister. Uh, it, it's great to have you with us here. And if we could start with, we must necessarily start with uh, the coronavirus uh, first. I think a lot of people uh, in Singapore uh, are wondering the key question is, how soon are we? Because I've been keeping track of the numbers daily. They've been falling for the last week or so. They've been in the low double digits, right? How close are we to starting to normalize the way New Zealand seems to be now? Well, first of all, Martin, it's a great pleasure to join you and also all our friends out there uh, who are joining in by webinar. It's an indication of how uh, the COVID-19 has actually impacted all our lives and how it's changed the way we work, how it's changed the way we think about what's important in life yeah. and how to organize our lives in a more efficient and effective way. So actually, I think we've found that we've been able to do quite a lot of things um, uh, effectively, um, even though we have uh, lockdowns or what we call circuit breaker in Singapore over several months. Uh, we are moving we have been able to bring uh, the um, to contain the uh, effects of the virus gradually and slowly through a, a very careful and painstaking process so it involves early detection uh, containment isolation and making sure that we can keep control of the situation but let's remember that the virus remains the same it's as infective as before. Yeah. It's as potent as before. What has changed is how we have responded to it in our daily lives mm. and the measures we've taken. Mm. So it's not a question of if we go back to where we were before. If we go back to where we were before without safety measures, we'll be in trouble. We'll be in trouble again yeah. because the virus is going to behave in exactly the same way. Yeah. And my experience in dealing with the virus over the last four or five months is that it is a very, very fast-moving virus. It will find all the nooks and crannies and all the crevices mm. and come through and surprise you in a way which you had not thought of before. Yeah. So we are going to open up, but in a very careful and controlled way. And we're already beginning to do that. Okay. Uh, talk to us about uh, air bubbles. How close are we, is Singapore, to having air bubbles with certain countries? Yeah. This, it takes two hands to clap. Yeah. So it's not a question of, oh, we are prepared to do it, but other countries must be prepared to do it. We must be confident of them. Yeah. They must be confident of us. Yeah. And quite frankly, in the world today, uh, most countries are frightened of each other. <laughs> so <laughs> so the, the thought of opening up, we, if you think you're safe, you want to be sure that the other person is safe. Yeah. We have done it with New Zealand. We have done it with Brunei. We have opened up yeah. uh, unilaterally with testing requirements. Uh, we've got bubbles uh, which we have with uh, Japan, with Korea, uh, with Malaysia. We've opened up uh, 
in a controlled way, but actually in quite a broad way. Okay. And we're discussing with a number of other countries as well. Mm. And uh, does this include the bubbles, the travel experience? Does it include quarantine or does it depend country to country? Uh, it depends on country to country. So it's a question of uh, testing, yeah. uh, either before uh, embarking on the journey or arriving in a country of destination. Some of it will require quarantine. Some of it will require abbreviated quarantine. And is it reciprocal then for Singapore? If yes. a certain country requires one week, then Singapore will require uh, one week as well? Well, what we have said is that we should conform with what the health requirements are in the country to which, which you are visiting. Okay. So that may vary from country to country. But with New Zealand and Brunei, we have quite confi reasonable confidence that they've got it under control. Okay. So we have uh, sort of minimal yeah. requirements and restrictions. Okay. See, so, Minister, let me, if you, if you don't mind, sure. uh, try and personalize this. For somebody like yourself, a senior leader in a government, how, what has the experience been? How has the coronavirus, <laughs> no, I, it's an honest yes. question, changed uh, your life? I mean, do you work from home like millions of other people, or, or how yes. does it, it work? Well, it's impacted everyone's life yeah. in, in Singapore and around the world, and everybody's working life, and some people have lost their jobs, so, or have been sort of, put on a furlough of some kind. Yeah. So it's uh, been a very serious impact on many people in Singapore and elsewhere. For myself, uh, I spent uh, much more time working from home okay. uh, and, and uh, I spent much more time working on uh, COVID-related issues, yeah. helping to manage uh, the outbreak specifically in our uh, migrant worker dormitories. Mm. Uh, but uh, And how is that going? Because that at one stage was pretty controversial and attracted a, a fair bit of criticism from outside. Well, actually, very few places in the world were ready to face such an infectious disease. Yeah. And most cities and most uh, domiciles are really not ready for it, whether it's a university hostel, whether it's a cruise ship, whether it's an aircraft carrier. Yeah. So if you say it's a lack of discipline and cleanliness, then why do nuclear-powered aircraft carriers from the United States and French nuclear-powered aircraft carriers get inflicted mm. with this? Mm. They are disciplined. They maintain good uh, uh, hygiene standards on board. In fact, they are designed to, 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 to continue fighting in a nuclear, biological and chemical Indeed. environment. Yes, yeah. Why do cruise ships get it? They are living in, in, in the lap of luxury. Okay. So, it is really whether or not your system was designed to be able to withstand the inf an infectious disease of this kind. And it's been shown that in a number of different settings, whether you're a developed city like New York or Paris, or whether you're a, a, a city in a developing country like New Delhi or Jakarta, you face serious problems because yeah. this is a disease which is highly infectious mm. and spreads. Mm. So all of us have to take this seriously. Yeah. For the dormitories, it took us quite a while to bring it under control because we wanted to do several things. We wanted to make sure that we looked after the workers well. Mm. They are here, they work, they, they are here to make an honest living, and it is our responsibility to look after them. Yeah. So we made sure we looked after their pay, we looked after their food, we looked after their health. And this shows in the extremely low uh, fatality rates. And it is not serendipity. Yeah. It was something which we set out to do mm. deliberately. Okay. It was planned. But, I mean, when we had the problem, we set out to achieve those objectives. Mm. For ex I give you one example. In many countries, if you are tested coronavirus positive, C+, you're asked to isolate at home, and your family members are asked to isolate at home. Yeah. Everyone who is tested coronavirus positive in Singapore is brought to a health care facility, including every one of the migrant workers in Singapore, and we, and we look after them. Mm. We had more than 20,000 pulse oximeters which we distributed to our migrant workers so that we could monitor their health status mm. daily, mm. hourly if we needed be. Uh, Senior Minister, have all of them been tested now? Yes. They have, okay. More than once. Okay. More than once. But you have to understand that no test is 100% perfect. 
So we have tested all of them. We know what their status is and they've started work already. All of them have returned to work, but we are, we trust, but we verify it. Yes. So all of them, in fact, everyone who works on a construction work site, which was where some of the initial infections and mixing took place, everyone has to go on a rostered routine testing cycle of once every 14 days. Mm. Everyone, whether he's a migrant worker, a Singaporean, if he mixes together in that worksite milieu, he has to be tested once every 14 days. Wow. And that's where we're getting some of these cases now because we're sort of running everyone through a filtration system again yeah. to make sure that we clean it all out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Singapore is part of global efforts to come up with a, a, a vaccine. I mean, some of the work is, is, is happening here. Can you update us on that? Sure. We are fortunate that we have invested over the last two decades in a fairly strong biomedical uh, sector in Singapore, yeah. R&D, and as well as a strong healthcare sector. And the two sort of overlap and, and reinforce each other. So we were able to come up very early uh, sequencing the uh, virus, and therefore that helped us to develop a, a very good test early, and that helped us combat the, 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 the virus. Uh, we have labs here who are doing uh, therapeutics as well. Mm. So there's some promise there. And we also have some vaccine candidates which are going into test. But I think the solution is not to look at a single country solution to a vaccine, mm. but to look at a global solution to a vaccine. Mm. So uh, I think uh, you and your readers will have read about COVAX. Uh, they've got 156 members uh, and they, uh, they, they have uh, enlisted uh, I think nine candidate vaccines yeah. from across the world. And the idea is that we should be able to bring the vaccine to those people most in need in all the, all the participating countries in the world, yeah. rather than having it being cornered by any particular country. Mm -hmm. So we are a big supporter of that. We think that's the way to go. And we, together with Switzerland, are, are chairing the sort of Friends of COVAX okay. uh, group to encourage more people to come on. And we hope that uh, some of the major countries which have not come on, yeah. like the US and China, will do so as well and soon. Yeah. Uh, when a vaccine does become available, uh, let's say through this COVAX initiative, for uh, people here in Singapore, will, they, will the vaccine be offered free, subsidized, or what is the intention? Or well, the initially we will make sure that those people who need it the most will get it. Yeah. So those on the front line, uh, our healthcare workers who are exposed to it, uh, and, and they have done a sterling job uh, in Singapore and elsewhere in the world, and so we must protect them. Yeah. And uh, there will be vulnerable groups like the, the elderly mm -hmm. and so on. So these are the groups which we will target first. Uh, and um, we haven't worked out the economics yet. Okay. Yes, but, but these are the groups that we will target first and make sure that uh, we can reach them first. But that's the whole point of COVAX, that we want to reach these groups all over the world, not just in a specific country. Sure, of course. Yes, that's what we would like to do. Of course. Senior Minister, you mentioned uh, China and uh, the United States. Uh, they don't seem to be playing nice with, with anybody these days, but we'll, we'll get back to that uh, in just a bit. But I want to move on and talk about uh, climate change because there's a, a big connection. Earlier on, at the beginning of the virus and uh, uh, the lockdown, etc., one of the unusual uh, experiences that a lot of people had was suddenly, oh my gosh, clear skies, yes. no pollution, I can see, no traffic, the waters, the rivers were clean, it was almost amazing, right? The irony and the sad thing is, you know, this was simply because activity had literally ground to a halt. Yes. So that obviously can't be the case. So the question now arises whether this can be an opportunity for governments around the world, including Singapore, to take a look at this and go, look, what has happened to climate change? Should we be using this as an opportunity to continue pushing climate change? Singapore is. Yes. I think this provides a wonderful opportunity to, as they say, build back stronger, or in Singapore we say emerge stronger yeah. from the crisis. And that's important. What you said is that, uh, you know, this is a, a temporary phenomenon 
where economic activity had to stop. I mean, I saw that too in the Beijing Olympics and the Athens Olympics, yeah. where suddenly the traffic jams disappear and the sky is clear. <laughs> you know? Because but they closed the factories only a week before, yeah. yeah but that's a temporary <laughs> phenomenon. How do we uh, get each country and the world uh, to move in that direction? I believe the European Union is making quite a big step uh, in that direction in its uh, recovery package, they've put aside quite a lot of money yeah. to build back stronger. Mm. And in Singapore, that's what we're doing too. Okay. And uh, it is something which we should not take our eye off because uh, while uh, COVID and the pandemic uh, is an immediate concern, climate change is a long-term concern which will affect all of us. Mm. And also requires global action for it to be effective. Mm. You, you can't take local action. Mm. Mm. Indeed. Uh, let me ask you, the, uh, the extra budgets that Singapore has already come up with uh, to offset or address the impact, negative impact of the coronavirus, how much of that money has gone towards uh, climate change related goals or targets? Or is that, is that mm. totally separate budgeting? Well, we have drawn on three three sets of reserves, if you like, yeah. in order to combat the COVID. First, we've drawn on our reserves of social cohesion and social harmony so that people hold together and help each other during the crisis and help to come through. Second, we have depended on our reserves of organisational capability, whole of government, whole of nation, yeah. in order to bring resources together to combat the crisis. Mm -hmm. And third, we have depended upon our financial reserves mm. in order to be able to fund all the things we needed to do to fight it and then to recover. So uh, climate change, and dealing with climate change, adaptation, mitigation, has always been a part of our, uh, if you like, our Singapore agenda. Mm. Uh, I mean, in, in a way we were green before green was fashionable. Okay. Because we realised early, and our, our first Prime Minister, Mr Lee Kuan Yew, I mean, he knew, and we all knew. We only have this one little island. If we despoil it, there's nowhere else we can go. Yeah. <laughs> so we better look after it as our precious little island mm. and make sure we look after it well. And that's why some of the steps which we've taken uh, early um, have been helpful. For example, uh, we moved from fuel oil for electricity generation. To natural gas. To natural gas. Yeah. We're almost 100% natural gas except for renewables uh, for electricity generation. And we did that at least 15 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, mm. well before anybody else is doing it. Yeah. I mean, in Europe, several major countries are still quite dependent on coal. Mm. I mean, we have moved nearly to a 100% natural gas as a transition fuel okay. 10, 15 years ago. Okay. So it cost us at that time because natural gas is expensive. Mm. But we were prepared to pay the price. Mm. Okay. Talking about the price, uh, specifically I know that Singapore is intending or planning to spend $100 billion to specifically tackle the issue of climate change. I can't remember whether it's over uh, 30, 100 40, years. 50 100 100 years. years. Okay. Uh, before we get into the details, uh, for viewers who are interested, does that necessarily, I mean, somebody's going to have to pay for it somehow. Does that necessarily mean taxes at some stage are going to have to go up? Perhaps I can, I, I, I left a, a little diagram. Perhaps I can ask uh, Please, our yeah. friends to, to let's, share let's it with, let's bring with that our viewers. Up and, uh, give viewers a look. And this well. describes uh, what we have in mind. Uh, so on the left, uh, you will see what is our nationally de uh, determined a contribution uh, and our targets up to 2030, we intend to peak our emissions by 2030. Uh, today, we are already one of the 20 best countries in the world out of 140 odd countries that were measured in terms of emissions per dollar of GDP. Mm. And by 2030, we intend to reduce our emissions intensity by 36%. Like by half, is that right? But no, 2030 on the left column uh -huh. 
our, we would intend to improve our emissions intensity by 36% compared to 2005. Ah. Now, on the right column, you will see this big number 33 there. What we intend to do by 2050 is to halve our emissions by 2050. Mm. And this is 33 uh, million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent. Now, you've got to understand that we're making a huge effort in this, even though we are responsible for about 0.1% of the world's emissions. Mm. But we think that it is important for every country to do its part. So we're going to do that and halve our emissions by 2050. And we're going to do this in uh, three key ways. The top in the middle uh, column there is transforming the way that we run our economy. So energy efficiency, carbon efficiency, we can talk about this later, mm. electrification mm. of the vehicles and so forth. In the middle, we're investing a lot in R&D. So in the last uh, five-year period for the research and innovation enterprise uh, package, yeah. out of uh, 15 billion, we have about a billion into sustainability and uh, and uh, environmental uh, investments in R&D. Okay. And the last part of that, uh, the, the bottom row in that, um, in that, uh, 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 in that middle column uh, talks about uh, international cooperation. Mm -hmm. And that includes things like uh, having properly working carbon markets and so on. So this is the mitigation part. Yeah. And then the adaptation part is what do you do to respond to the effects of climate change. And that's where the $100 billion comes in. Got it. And, and uh, if we do it slowly over a period of time and we do it smartly, we may actually get a positive return from it. And I'll explain to you how you, ah, if, you, okay. if, you, if, we, if you want to discuss that further. <laughs> Interesting, but it involves seawalls, it involves mangrove swamps, etc. Because one of the unusual things about Singapore, because of its uh, location uh, geographically so close to the equator, is for a lot of reasons which are too complicated to go into, it's more affected than most other places by rising sea levels, correct? Hmm. Yeah. Well, we are a very low lying island. Yeah. And uh, for, for those who, I mean, most of your uh, our audience are familiar with Singapore, we are just about 700 square kilometers. And that's about uh, 40, 50 kilometers. We're about a diamond. So 40, 50 kilometers on one diagonal and about 20, 30 kilometers on the other diagonal, yeah. 30 kilometers on the other diagonal. That's all. And quite a lot of our coastline is at or near sea level. Mm. So if you look at uh, Marina Bay, which I think many of your viewers uh, will be uh, familiar with, that is a multi how should I say, a multi-purpose development. Yeah. One of its key purposes is actually flood protection ah. for the city. Mm. So the barrage is actually to protect the city from very, very high tides. Mm -hmm. And it allows us to keep the level inside the marina reservoir below the sea level outside if mm. there's an extremely high tide. Mm -hmm. We actually have very powerful pumps to pump over the barrage out into the sea and keep the levels low okay. and prevent flooding in the city. But at the same time, it has allowed us to have a freshwater reservoir to add up to our water resources. And at the same time, it has allowed us to develop a new city centre. Three in so, one. Three in one. <laughs> so you can do something for flood protection, sea level uh, rise uh, uh, adaptation. Yeah but in an economically sensible way. Okay. And, you know, we could have reclaimed the whole lot, mm. filled it all out, including the bay itself. Yeah. But we left, you know, a donut is interesting yeah. only because there's a hole in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. I love donuts. But right. uh, you, you mentioned reclamation, uh, Senior Minister. If I'm not mistaken, since independence, the land mass, physical land mass of Singapore has increased by literally 25%, yes. a quarter by because of reclamation or through reclamation and Singapore is at the limits of that already otherwise you start encroaching into other people's territorial waters mm -hmm. is that true and if so how does that affect reclamation plans as part of uh, trying to offset uh, rising uh, sea levels well we we are very respectful of international law and international borders so so there's no danger of us encroaching into other people's territory okay. uh, and so uh, and we have increased our land area by, by, by the percentages that you talk about, mm. but actually over, over a very small base. Okay. 
So there is potential, and uh, the Prime Minister described this, uh, I think, two years ago, what we could do to protect the east coast of Singapore, which is uh, fairly low-lying. Yeah. We could develop, for example, a series of uh, barrier islands uh, between the coastline and the islands, mm. and then we could have a water body in between. The barrier islands could protect against uh, higher sea levels. Uh -huh. You could have land there which is developable, mm. which is very nice waterfront land. <laughs> so you have waterfront land on all sides, protection against flood, and a water body in between, which, depending on whether it's possible, could be fresh water, could be sea water. Yeah. And so you, you, if you can develop these things in an economically, um, with a positive economic return, mm. if you do it carefully, and thoughtfully mm. over a period of time. Okay. Today, we are investing something like $200 million a year anyway, Singapore mm. dollars, mm -hmm. on drainage works every year to make sure that we <laughs> drainage and flood control and all that in Singapore is well done. Okay. So if you talk about $100 billion over 100 years, I mean, it's something which is doable. Okay. And it's not just... <laughs> I mean, water down the drain. I mean, yeah. you, you, I mean money down the yes, drain. Yes, yes, yes. Understood, it, understood. It, you, you can get a return from it, yeah. just like Marina. Yeah, yeah. So, so far, we've been talking about uh, ways that Singapore is planning to uh, mitigate the effects of things like rising sea levels, which is a result of climate change. If we can talk about how Singapore is going to not or how Singapore's efforts to not aggravate the situation or, or make it worse, right? Which is the top part of uh, uh, the slide that we were looking at a few minutes ago. Offline, before we started this, we were talking about EVs. Yes. And a lot of people are still wondering uh, why there are not more EVs on the roads in Singapore when people had, I mean, Teslas were on the roads in, in Hong Kong more than a decade ago. Yes. What has happened here? Well. Because we do a complete accounting yeah. of the carbon footprint of vehicles. Yeah. A complete accounting. Uh, in Singapore, I mean, an EV is not a zero emission vehicle if you do a complete accounting of the energy. Because energy must come from somewhere. Yeah. And in Singapore, electricity generation today, uh, although it's the cleanest fossil fuel today, natural gas, which we switch to completely, it's still emitting. So if you have to count all that in, mm. then you have to see whether that is uh, that electric vehicle, electric powered vehicle, uh, is how does that compare with a very efficient ICE, internal combustion engine today? Mm. And you have to account, and you have to look at both of these on the same basis. Mm -hmm. And that's the proper scientific uh, climate change and uh, economic basis to look at the two. So you're saying uh, uh, on a whole cost basis, EVs are still not? Uh, uh, that was at that time. Uh -huh. But EVs have made tremendous advances uh, since then. Battery technology, uh, efficiencies and so on have gone up tremendously. Okay. So in fact, in Singapore, we have stated our objective to move towards a greener uh, vehicle fleet by 2040. Okay. We intend to have a vehicle fleet in Singapore which is greener vehicles by 2040. We are agnostic as to whether they are electric vehicles or they are hydrogen powered or, 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 or some form yeah. of these vehicles. The but, but no internal combustion engines by 2040? Hybrid vehicles may well have some Com sort of combination of the okay. two because there may be some use cases where that is needed, where you need high tractive power and yeah. so forth. Yeah. So, but in principle, we are moving towards an all green vehicle fleet by 2040. Already for public buses since March this year, every new public bus is either a hybrid or an electric. Mm. And uh, so that's the way we're going. Uh, we intend to develop a charging infrastructure in Singapore, because you can't have electric vehicles, for example, without a charging infrastructure. Yeah. You can't have hydrogen cars without a hydrogen distribution structure. Yeah. And so we intend <clears throat> to 
to, to, to implement, say, something like 28,000 charging points by 2030 in Singapore. Singapore is a bit different from other cities because uh, most of our people live in apartments and so cars are parked collectively in uh, collective car parks mm. and you, 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 you can't charge your car in your own garage. Yeah. So, so we need to have some kind of uh, public um, charging infrastructure. Yeah. But that's cars. But our intention is to move towards a, to lean towards public transport. Today, public transport accounts for about 70% of commutes. We intend to move towards 75, and at peak hours, 90% of commutes are by some form of private or shared uh, transportation means. Okay. Because I don't think it helps the city very much if you convert every internal combustion engine car today to an electric vehicle. Mm. You just have converted a traffic jam of internal combustion engine to cars jam. to a traffic jam well, of it electric is. vehicles. So, <laughs> okay. so right. I'm not sure that improves things very much. Okay. You actually have to reconceive mm. how you design a city. And many cities are moving towards car light, and we are too. Okay. Uh, Senior Minister, a few minutes ago, uh, in terms of powering literally uh, Singapore, you mentioned that uh, many, many years ago, Singapore made the decision to uh, go with natural gas yes. rather than, let's say, coal for electricity, for, for power uh, generation. Uh, this, I know this issue and this question has come up uh, a number of times, uh, but not very regularly. The last time I think I remember it uh, brought up uh, was probably a decade ago, and that is the issue of nuclear power. Mm -hmm. You've been quoted saying that, at, at that point when you were quoted, that not right now, not safe enough. And I think that is the, the key issue. What about today, though? Yes. Is it back on the table? Well, first of all, uh, the last time we used coal was probably the 1950s. Yeah. And then we moved to fuel oil, and I said, about at least a decade and a half, we have been natural gas already. Yeah. We looked at uh, nuclear energy, and we look at it very, very carefully. I, the The... Today's technology uh, for fission uh, nuclear reactors is not quite appropriate for Singapore yet. I mean, if you look at uh, Fukushima, the, 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 the nuclear reactors there, those were not the current generation, but a generation or mm. generation and a half ago. Mm. The evacuation area was 50 kilometers. Mm. That's bigger than the whole of Singapore. Mm -hmm. so <laughs> and still didn't help. It's yeah. not possible. But there are new generations of uh, uh, fission reactors and fusion reactors, which uh, offer some promise. But I would say that they are a generation or two generations down. Okay. And they are sort of like designed with fail-safe, inherent safety measures and so on. Uh, we had a very interesting seminar, a closed seminar uh, sometime last year, to examine all the nuclear technologies and the safety issues, including fusion. Mm. And we were looking very, very carefully at what the Europeans uh, have been doing with the new uh, Tokomak uh, project, mm. huge Tokomak project. And uh, some of the scientists said it's no longer science, it's engineering. That means the, the, the science problems have been solved. It's how to get it to work as an engineering uh, 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 sort of problem. Okay. I think that's a little bit optimistic, but that's where they assessed it to be. But these were people working on the project. Sure. So they know, but I think they are, they are inherently a little bit optimistic as well. <laughs> <laughs> With vet, uh, vested interests, uh, I understood. No, but they're very, so, very good people. Okay. Uh, so is nuclear power generation still an option for Singapore we sometime have, in the future? We have not ruled it out, and it is certainly uh, something which we have to keep um, uh, watching very carefully. Yeah. But this generation, and I think even the, 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 the sort of just the next generation, yeah. not quite suitable for us. Okay. We, we probably have to go two generations down in order to have uh, uh, nuclear uh, uh, energy which is appropriate for Singapore okay. with the safety requirements and so on. Um, so I, I think we have to look two generations down and maybe to fusion. Would it be fair to say that the honest truth also is uh, above and beyond everything we've talked about for uh, a small state like Singapore, the decision 
whether or not to go with nuclear power generation also becomes very much a political one. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, but we want to make sure we understand the science and we understand safety. That's why we have uh, about four or five years ago, we started a research institute in Singapore, uh, the Singapore uh, Nuclear uh, uh, Safety and Research Institute. Mm. So we want to make sure that we're completely up to speed on these issues. Yeah. We know all the issues with regard to nuclear power, nuclear generation and all the safety issues. Mm. So that in some time in the future, we uh, will be able to make a well-informed decision mm. on how to proceed. Okay. And also contribute to uh, regional thinking on the nuclear safety and the nuclear power. Because there, there will be countries in our region who are interested in that. Okay. Minister, we've talked about uh, the coronavirus. We've talked about climate change. Uh, one of the other huge challenges which Singapore is uh, facing, and not just Singapore as well, the rest of the world, is this increasing confrontation between the U.S. Uh, and China, both nuclear powers. What do you make of it right now? On the one hand, it started as a, a trade war and now has, through several different iterations, morphed into what looks to be a semiconductor or, or chip war. But at the same time, people are talking about a hot war as well with what's going on with Taiwan, with Hong Kong, in the South China Sea, etc. What, what do you make of all this? Well, if you allow me, Martin, I'll just take one step back and uh, look at the issues and the trends that we are facing today. And that's something perhaps... Uh, I, your, 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 your listeners, your, our, our participants might be interested in and how, how we think about the issues. I, I, I think I mentioned earlier, we see three major trends which uh, are going to drive uh, uh, sort of government action uh, where there are investment opportunities and these are healthcare, mm. uh, including longevity and so on, partly also because of COVID. Yeah. Then the whole sustainability issue, which we've talked about, and then digital, mm. which also has been given a, given a big push by, by COVID and all the Absolutely. lockdowns and circuit yes. breakers and so on, and the way that we are communicating with each other now. Exactly, yeah. Yes. So these, I think, are the three big um, opportunities uh, for, for countries, for companies, for investors. But I would say that there are also three risks and watch items. Uh, the first... Uh, as you mentioned, it's geopolitics, mm. how countries interact with each other, uh, how, what the shape of the world is, what is China-US relations. Mm. Uh, the second, I would say, is financial stability mm. because um, uh, many countries today have acted very, very quickly uh, to inject very large amounts of money uh, to keep the economies going, to keep jobs going. But that has, is going to have a tail and how that tail will be digested and worked out over the next five years, ten years, mm. will have an impact. And that's something to be watched and a risk. Mm. And the third factor really is the whole, balance, uh, the whole issue of uh, balanced development, uh, equity, and how the benefits uh, of growth are shared and how the uh, difficulties that may arise from the coronavirus and, and so on uh, may fall upon mm. different groups of people. And so these, these are the three watch things. Okay. But uh, we can come back to China and the U.S. if you want to. Sure. Yeah, well, let's do that, in fact. Yes. I mean, you're, you're a former Navy man, yes. uh, 20 years in the Navy, and finally retired uh, as, as uh, Chief of Navy, as a Rear Admiral. What do you think China's intentions are? And I think we talked about this offline. It is building a blue water Navy. That is a fact. We've seen the evidence uh, yes. already. Is it, in, is it its intention, do you think, to project power? or to defend access to the, uh, their country? Well, I, I'm not in the position to know what their intentions are. Yeah. But I've read uh, Admiral Liu Huating, and he, if you like, is the father of uh, 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 sort of naval thought, mm. naval strategy uh, in, um, in China. I, I had the opportunity to meet him ah. once. I was a very young young man then, and he, he was very kind and shared his views with me um, when he was passing through Singapore. We had a meal together. Uh, but he, he basically developed the concepts for China's naval strategy. 
But you have to understand that China is inher has inherently been a continental power. Mm. And that has been what its um, uh, orientation is. Yeah. And uh, even through the early years after 45, uh, when they went self-sufficiency, they looked at themselves as a continental power. Yeah. It's only in relatively recent times have they looked at themselves as a more with more widespread maritime interests. Mm. And, you know, the only time in its history when it was came close to that was in Admiral Tung He's time, when it sent its uh, uh, expeditions abroad, but it withdrew into itself quite quickly. Mm -hmm. So what is, the sea has been an axis of threat for China over generations, yeah. not necessarily an axis of opportunity. Mm. So I think now, they're changing their view because they, they trade with the world, their exports have to flow to the world, they bring their energy and raw materials from around the world, and the sea routes are important to them. Okay. And uh, I've had these discussions with my Chinese friends, and I've said, look, eventually, uh, you, together with other maritime trading nations, will come to the conclusion that the safety of the seas uh, free access to the seas are important to all countries, including yourself. And we will have more of an alignment of interest. And I hope that that will actually come about. Talking about alignment of interests, um, for myself and I think a lot of other people who follow what goes on in the South China Sea, one of the most frustrating things and puzzling things is why, even after so long, a COC code of conduct which everybody can agree on, for the South China Sea, still has not emerged, yes. been agreed on, or developed. Yes. Some of the critics say it's because of the approach that China is taking, let's say with regards to ASEAN, uh, the Southeast Asian 10, and that is, rather than negotiate with ASEAN collectively as a body, as a group, it is negotiating one-on-one -on -one directly, <laughs> and therefore, literally, uh, you know, picking off uh, allies, dividing and conquering. Yeah. Is that fair? Is that what they're doing? Well, does that make it harder, if well, true? Well, if we come back to the use of the sea uh, as, uh, for, for commerce, yeah. uh, freedom of the seas, navigation, and so on, that is provided for under UNCLOS, and actually every country in the world has an interest in that. Yeah. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a common, it's, it's a good, which is a public good, which every country actually has an interest in preserving. And China has contributed to it, for example, in keeping the Gulf of Aden open from piracy, which has been very helpful mm. and very useful. Now, that's a separate issue from territorial claims and so forth in the South China Sea. Now, when it comes to sovereignty, uh, it becomes very, very difficult <laughs> to resolve because, yeah. you know, we were talking about this earlier, Martin. It can't be yours in the morning yeah. and mine in the afternoon. Yeah and his tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. But, but you're saying if commercial interests are Correct. involved, right? if money is involved, it's a lot easier to negotiate. That's right. Sovereignty is indivisible. Yeah. But actually production sharing and the sharing of economic benefits are infinitely divisible. Yeah. Between two parties, three parties, four parties, it can be done. Yeah. And it has been done before. There's precedent for this, right? Yeah, I mean, even in our own region, uh, in the Gulf of Thailand, there have been negotiations over parts of the sea which have been uh, uh, sort of disputed, yeah. but production agreements have been able to be, you know, worked out. Yeah. Uh, in the Timor Gap yeah. between Australia and Timor Leste, uh, there have been production agreements negotiated, negotiated sometimes, but you know it can be done. Mm. You set aside the sovereignty, uh, and then you focus on how we can extract the economic benefits. Mm. And if all sides are benefiting from the economic mm. Makes output... it much easier to agree. Everybody <laughs> has got a vested interest in maintaining the stability. Okay. So it's not unusual for countries to do that. Yep. And um, I hope that uh, we can arrive at that. But the, but the COC and other kinds of arrangements are meant to maintain stability so that we don't have uh, flare-ups mm. which lead to situations which then become uncontrollable. Mm.
which leads me to, and we should probably start to, to yes, get please. to some uh, I'll be happy uh, participant to questions. But I'll be happy to do that. Very quickly, one last one, and this is, I think, one of the key questions, at least for the next, well, not even six months, uh, much, uh, much longer into the future, and that is come November in less than two months' time. The U.S. elections, whether it's a second term for Trump or whether Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, whether they come in, what does it mean for Singapore potentially, and what could it mean for the rest of the world? Yes. Well, actually, we had our own elections barely two months ago, three months ago. And one of the things, I mean, to be honest, at the back of our minds when we were trying to decide when to have an election was not just domestic issues, but the international environment. Mm. I mean, we looked at COVID and we thought, you know, are things going to get better or worse? We need to have an election. When do we have it? Yeah. Uh, I'm glad that we had an election because we've been able to put that behind us. And then we are now, we have a stable political environment and we can use that stable political platform to think about the future and to deal with some of these uncertainties, including what's going to happen in the, <laughs> the US election. Mm. The relations between US China, how COVID will develop, all these other things. Yeah. There are so many uncertainties, and I think it is good that we have put our own election behind us to provide us a stable platform for that. Mm. Now, uh, it would appear that there has been sort of bipartisan uh, feelings that um, um, uh, uh, there needs to be a renegotiation or re-evaluation re and a renegotiation of uh, relations between the U.S. and China. Mm. I think that is probably a given, mm -hmm. wh whoever wins uh, the election. But I would say that we should also not treat it as inevitable that the two countries will clash. Mm. I mean, I, I, I need to be more optimistic okay. than that. All right. And so it is not inevitable that the two countries will clash. I, I was doing my master's in public administration uh, 30 years ago uh, in, in, in Harvard, and Japan was number one, was the most popular book then. Mm. And there were books written called The Coming War with Japan. Yes, I remember. Yes. Japan. You would have read that yes. too. So... <laughs> I think it is incumbent upon all of us to make sure that this doesn't happen. Okay. I, I see that we can work to a more cooperative world and we can envision a better future for all of us. Mm. I mean, this is the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. Mm. And out of that huge global calamity, we developed the UN, its, its instruments, the International Court of Justice, the Bretton Woods institutions, mm. and that has kept the world together and progressing for the last 75 years. The last time we had a very major financial crisis, the global financial crisis, the G20 leaders meeting was born out of that. Mm. And the G20 leaders worked together to restore global financial stability and allow the world to move on and, and recover. Mm. I think we can do better than that as a world. Fingers crossed. I, I, uh, I would share that uh, hope as well. Senior Minister, if we could uh, very quickly, we have about a little over five minutes left. Let's get to some questions from uh, the participants or uh, the virtual audience. Uh, here's one. This is from Anonymous. And he or she asks, is suppressing the virus a huge mistake? How will Singapore manage to ever open up again if it sticks to a target of no COVID-19 cases? What would you say? Well, I would say that the assumption is wrong in that uh, we don't believe that we can get to no COVID cases, but we want to have a situation where we will be able, if any COVID case arises, to be able to contain it. Now, I have been dealing with this issue in Singapore for the last four to six months, personally. Yeah. I look at it every night, I look at it every morning. This is the first reports I read. Uh, we managed to contain it quite well in the first couple of months. But 
it almost got away from us in April and May. And in the first week of April, we had numbers in the low double digits. Mm. That's the first week of May. By the third week of May, we were having four-digit numbers, over 1,000 a day. Mm. And that's how fast it moves. Mm -hmm. And if you listen to what uh, the scientific advisor in the UK and the chief medical officer said, if it doubles every seven days, uh, the UK will have 50,000 cases a day. Mm. Within, I can't remember what it is, two months or something, mm -hmm. four weeks or mm -hmm. two months, mm -hmm. eight weeks. That's the way the virus moves. So we have to maintain strong preventive and containment measures and make sure that we don't end up in super spreading events, mm. which once it gets out of control, is very difficult to bring it back under control. So we are gradually opening up and we're opening up in a careful and controlled way with other countries. We have greater capabilities now, including testing, uh, 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 isolation facilities, and we understand the virus better. So it allows us to open up safely, mm. and we intend to do so. Okay. Uh, here's another one, uh, also from, in fact, I think all the questions are from anonymous. I don't know whether <laughs> that is a person or whether everybody is anonymous, but anyway. And this is, I think, uh, interesting and also relevant, uh, given uh, Credit Suisse, private banking, etc., because we talk about this whole issue of uh, generational wealth transfer a lot. Uh, the question is, do you think that the millennial generation has accelerated the rate of change in Singapore with regards to, or for example, in climate action, in working behavior? I think it is good that the millennial generation and the younger generation are more aware of uh, these issues, uh, environment, climate, and the global impacts. Now, for us in Singapore, uh, uh, we, I, I would say that from a government perspective, we are climate realists. Yeah. We don't take one extreme position or another. I mean, we have some people who, who, who say climate change doesn't exist, and there's another group of people who says that, well, climate change is the be-all and end-all of everything. But we are climate realists, we studied the science, we know what it means, we know it's serious, and we know that everybody has to do something about it, mm. and we're doing our best. So it's a good thing that the young generation are taking this all on board, and uh, it is, we need their, their support in order to get many things done. So for example, we are one of the countries which have put in uh, carbon pricing, mm. comprehensive carbon pricing. Mm -hmm. And we need the support of the public in order to have this done. This is an interesting question, Minister. Uh, talking about how the coronavirus has changed the way that we, uh, we, we live our daily lives. Mm -hmm. um, I, my wife cooks, but uh, a lot of people, I think, uh, they order in, deliver yeah, exactly. all sorts of delivery services, etc. And that has necessarily meant, and I think you've seen it too, uh, a very sharp increase in the use of plastic, as in plastic bags. So this is another question. Plastic use is a big issue for the environment. Why can't Singapore be harder on plastic use instead of slowly implementing policy? Shouldn't we be drastic? It sounds like uh, this person is, is a Singaporean, but mm -hmm. anyway. Well, um, plastic has important uses. Mm. I mean, it's, it keeps food fresh. It uh, keeps it <coughs> uh, healthy, prevents the spread of uh, uh, diseases and, and, and other things between foods and so on. And it helps to prevent waste mm. in food too. Mm. So plastic has its uses, but one must do so uh, in a careful way. So I think what is important is that we cut down on excessive packaging. Mm. Uh, we use it when we need to, for example, protect health workers. Mm. Uh, and then we must be careful to, when we dispose of it, to dispose of it in an environmentally friendly way. Mm. Make sure it doesn't go into the waterways. Uh, make sure that if we can recycle it, we recycle it. Mm. And I think 
that's the responsible thing to do. Uh, but, but plastics, I mean, they are an important part of uh, uh, the whole ecosystem because if we don't use plastics, we have to use something else. Is it wood? Mm. Is it paper? Pulp. Yeah. Pulp. I mean, so we, we need to, to do a full accounting as well yeah. from an environmental point of view. Yeah. Okay. You know, uh, online on social media, there have been some cheeky critics, I think, who've wondered out loud whether Singapore and its action to fight climate change is being held back because of the oil majors here. They are very early and still very significant investors, Jurong, Bukum, uh, etc. Are they being harnessed as to become part of the solution? Oh, or yes. are they holding Singapore back? Oh, they want to be part of the solution. I mean, I've spoken to some of them fairly recently. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, Royal Dutch Shell, for example, has just come out with a vision for the future. Yeah. But don't forget that in Singapore, we have probably one of the biggest biodiesel plants in the world, if not the biggest. Mm. It's a company called Neste, N-E-S-T-E. Okay. They opened, more than a, about a decade ago, the largest biodiesel plant in the world in Singapore. And they are investing in Singapore to double its capacity. Mm. And, you know, these are the things which we are doing in Singapore as well. So we are developing a whole suite of uh, solutions, mm. and, uh, and this is what we're doing. We are one of the first countries in the world to offer a bunker using natural gas, mm. which will also help to cut down maritime emissions by a very large amount. Minister, just uh, uh, seconds left, really. Yes. Uh, sum it up for us. Are you more optimistic or pessimistic today about the future? I have to be optimistic about the future. And I am. Yeah. Uh, coming out of the COVID-19, it showed that Singaporeans uh, had very strong social cohesion. We worked together. We drew upon that to build a future. I think for individuals, for countries, we need to do that. So we have moved in Singapore from trying to preserve jobs to trying to move companies and workers to new jobs of the future, including green jobs. Okay. Then we need to envision a world which is more cooperative than the world which we have today. And I don't think that uh, 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 bifurcation and uh, uh, collapse of the international uh, architecture is inevitable. Mm. It's up to us to see what we can do. Mm. And we in Singapore, we will work towards that. And I am optimistic that there are many people, many countries in the world, which share the same ambition and that we will be able to come out of this crisis, emerge greener and stronger. Okay. I certainly hope so, too. Yes. Uh, Senior Minister, thank you so much for your time. It's been, it's been always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you, Martin. And uh, thank you for spending time with and, us. And, and thank you to our friends out there as well. our uh, participants and also uh, viewers. That is going to do it for uh, the 11th and final uh, webinar in the uh, Super Transit series. Thank you so much for spending time with us, and we'll see you again hopefully next year. Take care.